Thank you to everyone for joining us for the Safety Center's January webinar. My name is Jamie Sullivan, and I am the manager for the National Center for Rural Road Safety. This month's webinar is entitled Framework for Bikeway Designation on Rural Roads. I'm going to go ahead and close down all of these polls so that we can talk about the numbers. Um, it looks like we have most of you joining us by yourself, about 82%. As always, we do have a few of you in groups and conference rooms, and I will be giving you instructions here shortly for how to go about providing us with names and information from that. Um, it does look like we have about 73% of you who are joining us by computer only. Um, as always, I will remind you, if you do have any audio issues, if you're joining us by computer only, that we would ask you to call in. The phone number can be found in the top left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, sometimes the audio issues are called just or caused just by the um, the internet issues. If you do have any additional issues, you can also private chat the WTI staff member who is listed in the host, um, and she can also try and assist you. As far as what organizations are joining us today, it seems like we have about a little over 8% from federal DOT, about 21% from state DOT, 17% from local DOT about 4% from tribal governments, 4% uh, from public lands agencies, about 13% from other federal, state, or local government agencies. Um, we have about 2% from emergency response, and about 3% from educational institutions, and about 21% from private consultants. And there are a few others in, you as well, in there as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, as far as where you're coming from today, we have about 21% from the Northeast, about 20% from the Southeast, 21% from the Midwest, 30% from the West, and about 6% other. Um, and again, we hope everyone is staying warm with all of the cold weather that we have going on across the country. I'm going to move us over to our presentation now. A few webinar logistics that we like to go over at the beginning of each webinar. Today's webinar will be an hour and a half long, and it is being recorded and will be provided on our website within the next week. Uh, because of the quality of the recording is better, we have muted all phone lines for the presentation other than our presenters. Because of this, we will ask you to put your questions into the chat pod on the left-hand side. You can go ahead and put those in that chat pod at any time. You don't have to wait for us to stop for question and answers. Uh, when we do hit a question and answer period, I will read out all of those questions to our um, presenters. There will be three uh, periods today at which we will stop for question and answers. If you are listening by phone, we would ask you to please mute your computer speakers, otherwise you will hear feedback. Uh, I do also want to point out, in the top right-hand corner of your screen, there are four arrows that press outward. Uh, if you do want to make your presentation itself full screen and get rid of some of this extraneous information along the outside, you may do that. There will be several different graphics um, and figures that are shown throughout today's presentation, and at that time you may want to make your screen full screen for better viewing. There's also a handout pod in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, from there, you can download not only a PDF version of today's PowerPoint presentation, but also a few handouts that the presenters today will be referencing. For all of those of you who are joining us in groups, as always, if you could please supply us with a list of those of you in those groups, as well as your email addresses, and send that to info, I-N-F-O, at ruralsafetycenter.org. That will allow us to send you the surveys um, directly following today's webinar. As always, we will have two surveys for the webinar. There will be one sent out directly following today's webinar, and that one will ask uh, slightly more questions. It will be about the content for today's presentation, our speakers, and how um, how they did, as well as allowing you to select whether or not you would like certificates of completion or CEUs. Uh, the second survey will come out three months later, and that survey is a very short one of four questions, and we're more looking to find out what you've done with today's information. Perhaps you've looked into this topic more, perhaps you've started to um, to put into place the framework for applying this in your own state, perhaps you've forwarded along to other um, 
other colleagues of yours. So that's the type of information we're looking for in the second survey. In case you do not receive the survey but are interested in those CEUs or certificates of completion, you can now find the survey link on your screen. Again, the PDF version of these of these PowerPoint is available in the handout, so you are welcome to download that so you have the survey link. The survey closes two weeks after our webinar. You can usually expect CEUs to arrive around three to four weeks after the webinar. We have sent out um, everything through November because of the holidays in TRB. We are a little behind on the December ones, but those should be coming out soon. The CEU form needs to be returned to continuingedmontana.edu at montana.edu and not to the safety center. Uh, that form is provided by a different department at Montana. Uh, you will receive it, however, with your certificates of completion. And I'm going to show you just an example of what those look like. On the top left-hand corner right now, you'll see what a course registration form looks like in order to apply for those CEUs. And in the bottom right-hand corner, um, is a verification of completion form. You can request these after you have applied for CEUs. This verification form will show you uh, the date in which you took the webinar, which webinars you took, and how many CEUs you have obtained. You can request those again from um, the Continuing Ed Department at Montana State, and it will show all of the webinars with which you have um, asked for CEUs from us. Today's presenters, we are lucky to have three with us today. We have Amy Thomas. Amy is the Deputy Director of Engineering for the Alaska and Pacific Northwest regions of the USDA Forest Service. Amy supports the Directors of Engineering in providing engineering, fleet, and sustainable operations guidance to the 19 different national forests and areas in our Alaska and Pacific Northwest regions. She previously worked as the Engineering Partnership Program Leader and has extensive experience partnering with multiple groups to collaborate on projects which mutually benefit the Forest Service, special interest groups, and private landowners. Prior to joining the USDA Forest Service, Amy worked for various agencies within the Department of Defense, beginning her professional career as an active duty U.S. Army engineer officer. Amy graduated from the U.S. Military Academy, West Point, in 1998 with a B.S. in Civil Engineering and earned her Master of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Hawaii. Next, we'll have Rebecca. Rebecca is a research engineer for the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. She is a key team member of the Small Urban, Rural, and Tribal Center on Mobility. For the past 11 years, she has worked on various projects aimed at making it safer and more convenient for people in small towns and rural areas to get around by bicycle, foot, bus, and rideshare. Rebecca was the primary author of the Guide to Promoting Bicycling on Federal Land, the first comprehensive report that examined bicycling issues in federal lands and gateway communities across the country. She was part of a team with Alta Planning and Design and others that created the Small Town and Rural Multimodal Networks Report, intended to help small towns create active travel options for people of all ages and abilities. And she's currently working on the framework that she's going to be discussing today. Lastly, we'll have Taylor Lonsdale. Taylor has 22 years of civil engineering experience and is a key team member of the Small Urban, Rural, and Tribal Center um, on Mobility at the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University as a research engineer. As a member of this group, Taylor is working on projects that inform the ability of communities to increase the quality of life through changes to the built environment. Taylor is currently involved in research supporting improved bicycle and pedestrian accommodations and safety on rural roads. The focus of his work is on how infrastructure and land development choices affect the ability of people of all ages and the ability to move around their community on foot and on bike. His true passion is empowering people of all ages to walk and bike safely in their communities. And we do thank all of them for being here today to share their experience with us. So today, what you can look for, um, once you've completed this webinar, you will have an overview of the development and content of the framework for bikeway designation on rural roads. This document was developed as a resource for road owners that are considering bikeway designation on one of their roads. The framework addresses liability and safety concerns that road owners frequently face when considering roads that are shared by motor vehicles and people on bicycles. To achieve this webinar goal, you will learn uh, six different learning outcomes today. The first is to state differing points of view on bikeway designation by bikeway proponents and road owners. 
to demonstrate an understanding of the background and need for the framework for bikeway designation on rural roads, to identify relevant data to consider when evaluating the safety of a shared road, to differentiate between the quantitative and qualitative considerations of bikeway designation, to identify key components of a bikeway field safety visit, and lastly, to summarize the benefits and outcomes of a bikeway field safety visit. And at this time, I am going to turn over our presentation to our first presenter, Amy Thomas. Amy? Thanks, Jamie, for the introduction. So real quick, and just to start, I wanted to just do a sound check and make sure folks can hear me OK. Yep, we can hear you fine. OK, great. So apologize that I wasn't able to provide a picture on one of those previous slides uh, a week ago. I probably wouldn't have predicted I'd be able to join you today, but I'm very thankful to be back to work and here with everyone. So good morning and afternoon to everyone. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to see so many folks participating in today's session. I'll be attempting to introduce the project from the perspective of a federal land management agency. And I'll be focusing on these first two learning objectives. So first, I'd like to start with some context setting regarding the USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest region and the transportation system we manage. Visually, the map here on the slide depicts the designated scenic bikeways across the state of Oregon relative to Forest Service land, which is shown in green. And now I wanted to offer some important statistics that I think demonstrate both the opportunities and complexities at play as we discuss the Sharing the Roads to Federal Lands project. So specifically, the Pacific Northwest region encompasses the two-state area, Oregon and Washington. We manage 24 million acres across 16 national forests two national volcanic monuments, one national scenic area, and one national grassland. 15 million acres of national forest land across 11 national forests and one scenic area are in the state of Oregon. Regionally, we manage approximately 90,000 miles of road, of which 58,000 miles are open for public use. In the state of Oregon, we have 44,000 miles open to the public. Currently, the deferred maintenance on our regional road system is approximately $770 million. And not surprisingly, we've seen dramatic decreases to our roads budget over the past 30 years, including a reduction of more than 40% just in the past 10 years. And so our, our regional transportation system supports many different activities. And um, I, did ha I did pull some statistics from a report that we did showing our accomplishments in 2017. The, the 2018 figures weren't yet available. So in 2017, the, the transportation system supported 581 million board feet of timber harvested, which is enough to build 34,000 homes. It also supported more than 1.8 million worth of special product, forest products sold more than 500,000 acres of restoration and fuels reduction work, 723 miles of stream habitat restored or enhanced, and it supported 15.3 million recreation visits, which generated 730 million in visitor spending. And so drilling down into the state of Oregon specifically, we manage as an agency 15,000 miles of trails, 1,530 recreation sites, 11 ski areas, 40 wilderness areas, 45 wild and scenic rivers, and two national recreation areas. And I am pulling much of those state-specific statistics from one of the handouts that you all have in the pod there. I think it's titled Oregon Recreation Fact Sheet. So um, please do download a copy of that. It's, it's very useful and gives you kind of a picture of the challenges we face as an agency. So I share those statistics not to overwhelm you, but I, I do hope they, what they speak to are both the challenges and opportunities that exist when considering scenic bikeway designation. 
which really became the impetus for this project. As the state scenic bikeway program continued to gain momentum, um, at the end of 2017, I think there are 16 official scenic bikeway designations. Federal and local road agencies recognize the need for some type of tool or process that would assist them in evaluating and determining how best to support this unique recreation opportunity, given the obvious concerns around lack of funding for road maintenance or improvements, the mixed motorized and non-motorized use occurring on these rural roads, as well as the typical physical characteristics of these roads. So we established a technical advisory committee to assist WTI with the development of the document. And what we were really trying to do was represent the diversity of perspectives we felt were necessary to ensure a good product. So we had members um, that were representing road owner, manager perspectives, engineers, planners, and bicycle advocates. We also had a very good representation of organizations, including federal, state, and local governments. And I think it's also important to note that the USDA Forest Service and the Association of Oregon Counties partnered as the co-applicants to successfully secure the Oregon Federal Lands Access Program funding for this project. I also, I also do want to note that there were many other Forest Service folks that assisted with this project. So even though I'm, I'm the only one listed there, we had a lot of other help that um, made, made the product even better in the end. OK, so this is one of my favorite slides. And uh, one of the main challenges is often the differing and at times opposing perspectives of the various stakeholders coming to the table around this, this issue or opportunity. So while bikeway proponents and tourism groups are excited to showcase Oregon's stunning natural beauty on rural roads, as you can see in the graphic on the left, Road owners and engineers, while recognizing the benefit of bringing visitors, cyclists to small towns, are also concerned about safety and liability, as can be seen in the graphic on the right, where you see bicyclists riding alongside large recreational vehicles, some evidence of recent rockfall, limited pavement markings, and little to no road shoulder. Also contributing to road owners' concerns are rider expectations. And what I mean by that is the inherent differences with a program like this that includes official designation with road signage, cycling cue sheets and route info, and highly successful marketing campaigns advertising this experience versus a bicyclist who might choose to ride on another rural road that's not been designated which, by the way, would include any of our Forest Service roads open to the public since we don't explicitly prohibit bicycling. But would cyclists riding on a designated Oregon Scenic Bikeway expect more in the way of bicycle facilities, improved road conditions, and less hazards? And if so, how would we consider that, given what was shared earlier regarding our deferred maintenance needs, decreased funding levels, and a transportation system serving multiple uses. So the project goals were twofold. And you could categorize them, as mentioned earlier, um, into the quantitative and the qualitative. And so from my federal land management agency perspective, first and foremost, um, you know, as an agency managing land and resources, we do that according to policy in the form of manuals and handbooks. And so our road managers and engineers really wanted a practical toolkit that would help lead them through the process of bikeway designation and would, inclear, would include engineering analysis and result in a data-driven recommendation and subsequent decision. Equally as important, which we all quickly learned throughout this project, were the more qualitative goals centered around communication, relationships, and partnerships. 
Listening to understand was an underlying theme critically important to navigating the different and opposing perspectives surrounding bikeway designation. Thank you very much, Amy. And at this point, we are going to stop for questions. If you do have questions, which I see some coming in already, you can type those in on the chat pod on the left-hand side. We do have a few questions for our audience right now as those other ones are coming in. I've switched over to those now. The first way one is, bikeway designation comes with additional funding to improve bicycle facilities on rural roads. True or false? Or I don't know, I don't remember. And the second one is, which of the following is not one of the goals of the framework for bikeway designation on rural roads? To be a resource for road owners who are approached to designate a bikeway on one of their on one of their roads, to provide road owners with information on how to be more involved in the bikeway designation process, to discuss factors to consider in road owners' decisions on bikeway designation, to identify expensive infrastructure projects to be implemented to make roads safer for bicycling, or I don't know, I don't remember. So we'll give everyone just a few seconds to go ahead and fill those out. Okay, and at this time, it looks like everyone has entered their answer. So I'm going to go ahead and end those polls. Amy, you should be able to see at this time the percentages if you'd like to go ahead and talk through those. Okay, great. So um, it looks like, like folks, even though I may not have explicitly stated it, um, you did pick up on the fact that it's true this program when designating roadways as bikeways does not provide additional funding, which is really a challenge as a, as, a, as a road owner to manage the risk, inherent risk that would be involved in advertising that type of use given the, the physical characteristics and some of those other challenges we talked through. So it looks like everybody picked up on that in both of those questions. And then I, I'm, not tacking, I'm not tracking many of the questions, Jamie, on the left, if you want to help me. <laughs> Absolutely. So the first question we have for you is, are there service stations or call stations for cyclists along the roads in case of emergencies? And by service stations, I mean air stations, bike patch, small footprint places cyclists could use. Um, so I will answer that um, in general by saying no. In fact, uh, many of the bikeways that, and I'll speak for the, bike, the bikeways that include forest service roads, are often in areas that don't have cell phone service as well. So there is no um, service station or place like that along the route in general. and. Um, cyclists are often unable to use their cell phones as well if they needed help. And so that is something that is also um, contributes to the risk that, that we all need to consider when, when working through this process. And I see Alex is on, which is great. Alex Phillips just typed in the pod there, Jamie. <laughs> yes, I saw that too, so that's perfect. Um, so Rebecca and Taylor, if you do have questions that would need to be um, send to Alex, please let us know. And Alex, if you could send a message to our WTI staff member with your phone number, we're able to un unmute your phone line so you'd be able to speak as well. Um, Amy, there is one more question for you, and that is there is a constant fear from road owners that designating a route as a bikeway somehow will significantly raise expectations of cyclists. I've never seen any evidence that this is true, but it seems to be an excuse to deny designation. So I, I don't see a question there, and I can appreciate that perspective. And I think that throughout this project, um, that perspective was at the table um, as well as the opposing view. And so I, I don't know if we have any, and, and I don't know if Alex wants to offer her opinion on this. I'm not sure if we had any substantial data to show um, to support either of those perspectives. And, and honestly, I think 
we continue to work through how to navigate across the differences of opinion in that regard. So thank you for that comment. Uh, thank you, Amy. And again, we're going to try and get Alex um, unmuted so that she can as well answer questions for you. At this time, um, I am going to turn it over to Rebecca to discuss our next two learning objectives. Rebecca? Great. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction, Amy. So I'm going to talk about um, these next two goals, identifying relevant data to consider when evaluating the safety of a shared road, and then also differentiating between the quantitative and qualitative considerations for bikeway designation. So here's, we have six chapters in the document, and Amy gave you a good overview of chapter one, and I'm going to talk about chapter two and three, and then Taylor will pick up and talk about the remaining chapters at the end. So chapter two gives an overview of existing bike route designation uh, processes across the United States. So Adventure Cycling Association has done a really amazing job with the U.S. Bicycle Route System, and here's a picture of their map. It's a little hard to see, but there are solid lines which show existing cross-country bike routes, and there are dashed lines which show corridors where there's um, anticipated routes in the future. And the vision is that anyone can get to their destination by bicycle using a numbered U.S. Bicycle Route, whether it's across town or across the country. Uh, U.S. bicycle routes connect urban and rural destinations, um, and they will create what will eventually be one of the largest networks in the world with 50,000 miles of bicycle routes. As of early 2018, there were 13,114 miles of U.S. bicycle routes that had been established in 26 states. Their process has three different phases, planning, designation, and then signing and promotion. And the U.S. bicycle route system designation process varies significantly between states, depending on which stakeholders get involved, the number of road jurisdictions, and whether the process is prioritized and, and the deadlines are met. So I'm not going to go into detail. We describe the process in the document a little more. Um, but in short, all of the states have to submit their bikeway application to AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, and the application has to be signed by the head of the State Department of Transportation. So it's quite a big process of, of coordination. In our document, we chose to focus more on the Oregon Scenic Bikeway Program. It's a well-established program, um, and our funding came out of Oregon as well. And so I'm going to talk in more detail about this program and, and how their designation process works. We analyzed their process and came up with some ways that road owners could become more engaged in the process. So the Oregon program is a partnership between Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, Travel Oregon, which is a destination tourism organization, and the Oregon Department of Transportation, and Cycle Oregon, which is a group that, that leads um, cycling tours around Oregon. They also have a three-phase process to get to bikeway designation, and they've developed some really great tools. Um, there's a screenshot of one of them. Um, they have a, a guide, a handbook, that's about how to write an Oregon Scenic Bikeway Plan, and they have a lot of, um, a lot of resources for proponent groups who want to implement a, a bikeway. Their program, here's a list uh, from their website of the top 10 most important features to become a scenic bikeway in Oregon, natural and human-made scenery, pleasing sounds and smells, road conditions, um, they look for roads that, um, this could be potholes or pavement condition, roads with lighter traffic, which are, are more comfortable for people to bike, low volume roads, and do the roads have a, a separate space or shoulder for a bike lane. They also look for strong support from all of the road jurisdictions, that's really important, and dedicated proponent groups to help market and make sure that people come to the bikeways once they're designated. Um, and so we looked for opportunities within Oregon's process to, I guess let me step back really quick. Um, 
what we what we found when we analyzed Oregon's program was that the resources are are really focused on marketing and and encouraging people to come to the bikeways and they consider safety. It's definitely part of the process, but there aren't any specific resources available to guide the road owners through what is safe enough or how to consider safety issues when they're when they're being asked to designate a road as a bikeway. And so we took a closer look at Oregon's process and here's a flow chart to try to show how the phase one of their process works. So phase one is a bikeway application. The bikeway proponent group approaches all of the road owners that are um, where a section of bikeway is proposed and they ask them to provide a letter of support for bikeway designation. And so at this point, an initial letter of support is required for the application to move forward. And the road owners could say, yes, we think that's a great idea. We really understand the benefits of bringing bicycle tourism to these small towns. And you know, we think that that's a great idea on, on this route. Or they could say, well, maybe we really support the idea of a bikeway, but we have some specific concerns, um, safety concerns about a couple areas on our bikeway, and we want to make sure we address those before moving forward. Or they could just simply say, no, we, you know, there's really heavy logging activity on this road, or for whatever reason, um, we really uh, don't believe that a bikeway is, is a good idea, and then the process would end there. The rest of this document, um, or the rest of what I'm going to talk about right now, is focused on the road owners that are in that maybe category. Uh, they think it's a, a good idea and they'd like to support it, but they're concerned about safety. Uh, and so the next, whoops, let me go back one more time. Um, so, so the letter of support, um, if all the road owners write a letter of support, the bikeway application moves forward to Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. They review it and they go out on a bicycle ride to assess the route. And if, it's, if this group thinks it's a good route, uh, they evaluate it. Um, based on its scenic and roadway characteristics, then it moves forward to phase two. And so phase two is writing a bikeway plan, and the proponent group and the road owners work together on this section. In the past, the, the existing program, uh, the bikeway plan is really focused on how the proponent group will plan and manage the bikeway from a marketing perspective. And after evaluating this process, this new approach recommends that proponents first focus on understanding and addressing the road owner's concerns. And only if that is accomplished will the bikeway plan move forward. And so we've suggested, and this is outlined in the document, um, a bikeway safety evaluation, which is shown in that second box there, and a bikeway, possibly a bikeway safety field visit if needed. And the bikeway safety evaluation is um, a process that road owners can use to identify uh, relevant data related to bikeway safety and organize that data and, and come up with some sort of analysis on the safety of the bikeway. And I'm going to talk through that right now. And so if we go through this process and then the road owners say, yep, we think that really addressed our concerns, um, then that could get the road owners to a final letter of support. If they go through that process and they're still unsure, then maybe we go to the second part of bikeway safety field visit um, to bring all the stakeholders together in the field and talk through the issues. And Taylor's going to talk about that after I'm, I'm done with my section. So chapter three is really of the document is really focused on this, this written bikeway safety evaluation. Some factors to consider are traffic volume, the percent of large vehicles, motor vehicle speed, and pavement width, to name a few. And we talk about these in more detail in the document. Um, this is a chart from the Oregon Department of Transportation that um, probably most folks in the Scenic Bikeway Program in Oregon are familiar with this. And um, this was developed, uh, as you can see from the left side of the chart, it, it shows speed in miles per hour. And along the bottom of the chart, it has average daily traffic or the traffic volumes, how many vehicles there are per day. And this chart would indicate that uh, for, for low volume roads where the traffic, daily traffic is less than about 1,200 cars per day, um, 
that it may be appropriate for bikes and cars to share a lane for up to 50 miles per hour. And similarly, for, for roads that have really low speeds, about 20 miles per hour or less, um, it may be appropriate for cars and bikes to share a lane uh, for as, as high as 5,000 cars per day. And that's the white area shown on this graph. And then the gray areas and the black areas are where maybe the traffic volume and speed combinations are a little higher, where you might need some sort of wider shoulder or separation. And so for the Forest Service roads in Oregon, most of them are very low volume and fall within that white area. And so there's been a lot of talk about, you know, is this graph, if falling in the right area of this graph, is this enough to, to give, uh, is this safe enough for, um, for, to designate as a bikeway? And I just want to point out that this chart alone does not provide enough information to make a solid decision about whether a rural road should be designated as a bikeway. It's one part of the conversation, and there's a lot of other information that should be considered, um, which we're going to talk about here, here next. Um, so Wisconsin has developed a method to assess their rural roads for cycling, um, and it's used, we chose to use this method because it's relatively straightforward and it's very sensitive to rural roads with very low traffic volumes. It has been used in Wisconsin for many years, and this chart shows generally how state and county highways in Wisconsin were classified for bicycling conditions. So green area is good, blue is moderate for bicycling, and the red is undesirable or poor. And you can see they consider the width of the roadway, the traffic volumes, and they also factor in more information of the percentage of truck traffic and the percent solid yellow line or no passing zones, areas of limited sight lines. And so I'll, those, those aren't shown on this graph, but I'll go into those in more detail. So we came up with an example um, proposed bikeway, the beautiful river and mountain bikeway USA. It's 60 miles long. Located in Oregon, it stretches across several different jurisdictions, which is jurisdictions, which is very common for bikeways. Part of it's on state DOT road, part on county, and part of it on Forest Service road. It is a really beautiful place with amazing views of rivers and mountains and fabulous place, places to camp, and it even has hot springs. Everybody's really excited about this bikeway. Um, the road owners all, all provided letters of support from all of the jurisdictions. However, uh, the Forest Service really was interested in designating this as a bikeway, but they had some specific concerns that they stated in their letter of support that, that needed to be addressed, and those are active timber hauling, lack of shoulders, really difficult to see in places, the road is really slick. Um, very steep descents and blind curves, and some some crash history that's that's concerning and, and should be looked at further. And so we're using this example um, to walk you through how how road managers could evaluate this road for safety. So we broke it into three steps um, shown here, breaking the bikeway road into segments, um, using that assessing the road based on volume and speed for that Oregon Department of Transportation chart I showed you, and then finally um, doing a little more detailed analysis based on um, the Wisconsin method. And so how might you break the road into segments? Um, you could look at, you know, the road is 60 miles long, so it might be difficult to um, analyze the entire road. You could break it into different segments based on the roadway characteristics, straight sections of road that have higher speeds, like the Department of Transportation road uh, with 55 mile per hour speed and, and shoulders, um, and then part on the county road, which may be a little narrower and lower speed limit, and then you could break it into a section on the Forest Service road as well that um, that is the area of most concern for, for bikes. And so once you've broken up your, your road into different sections, 
then you can look at the data that you have and go through, run through this analysis. So we're just going to take one section of road. The, the area of most concern is about a mile long, very steep and curvy section on a forest service road. The traffic volume is really low. It's estimated at about 600 cars, vehicles per day on the weekdays and about 1,200 on the weekends. There weren't actual counts, but uh, the Forest Service engineers felt pretty confident that these are pretty realistic numbers. There isn't a posted speed limit, but the operating speed is estimated at 35 miles per hour. So if we plug these numbers into the Oregon guidance, we can see that the, during the weekdays, when there's 600 vehicles per day at 35 miles per hour, um, this chart would suggest that that it, it may be appropriate for cars and bikes to share a lane. And if we look at the weekend numbers, um, it falls kind of on the edge of the white and the gray area. So it may be appropriate, but we may want to think about um, you know, a need for something else. Um, so let me step back. Um, and maybe this chart, you know, as I mentioned before, it's it's um, focused on an urban context, and most of the Forest Service roads, if not all in Oregon, may fall within that white area. Um, it may be more useful for screening out roads that you wouldn't want to have a bikeway on unless if they fell within the black or gray areas and there wasn't an opportunity for road shoulders. Um, this could be a tool to, to screen out some of the roads. Um, so that's kind of an initial screening tool, and then the next step would be to look at a little more data and run through Wisconsin's method. And so this is the data we use for that on, on this example bikeway. Uh, the pavement is very narrow. Um, we have about a 20-foot wide pavement section for this, this forest, section of Forest Service Road, so two 10-foot lanes. We're using that same traffic volume, 1,200. And the engineers estimate that about 60% of this segment of road, um, there's not actually solid yellow lines because there aren't any pavement markings on this road, but that 60% of it is really curvy and, and a place where there's limited sight distance that would be a no passing zone. And there are quite a few trucks, there are 13% trucks um, that are common on this road. So this page shows, or this slide shows uh, the Wisconsin's um, methods information, and they have different charts like this for various width roadways, and this page shows for up to the 22 foot wide roads. And the first table here is an adjustment that's made for the percent solid yellow line, so you look at your average daily traffic of 1,200 and you subtract out 25. Um, for this adjustment and come up with 1175. Then you go to the table on the bottom, which shows what the rating is for the condition for bicycles. And if you have 13% trucks at 1175, um, you can go over and see that this particular segment of road has a moderate rating for bikes. If you had less than 930 vehicles per day, it would have a good rating. If you had greater than 1280 per day, it would have a poor rating. And so this provides uh, road owners with a process and a way to organize, to, to identify the data that's relevant to um, bicycle safety and to organize it and to systematically categorize their road segments and get an idea of which segments are good or a moderate or poor based on this Wisconsin method. Um, and so some questions, um, how, how do we make sense of these results? Well, I guess, first of all, I need to say that this process won't give road owners a definitive yes or no answer. Um, it really just provides more information that can be used as a basis for decisions when, when talking to proponent groups. and. Um, designating a road as a bikeway does not mean that the road has ideal or perfect conditions everywhere for everyone that bikes. Roads that have poor pavement conditions in places, limited sight distances, some truck traffic, 
or other conditions that make them less than ideal should not be automatically disqualified from, from bikeway designations. Um, and so this is some of the quantitative data that can be looked at to help make decisions. And Taylor is going to talk about some of the qualitative. Oh, let me step back. Um, so these were the initial issues that were mentioned in the road owner's letter of concerns. And in our example, um, going through this process didn't answer all of these questions. And so you know, we think that it is valuable to go meet with the proponents and the stakeholders in the field to talk through these and discuss some of the more qualitative um, issues. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And at this time, I am going to ask everyone a few more questions. Um, but before I do that, I do want to remind everyone the chat pod is on the left-hand side. There are some questions coming in already. But if you do have any questions for Rebecca, please put those in on the left-hand side again. OK, so the questions that we have for you, the very first one is, what quantitative data is relevant to consider when evaluating safety for bicyclists on rural roads where people driving and biking in the in the share, sorry, when people driving biking share the same lane. Check all of them that apply, please. Traffic speed, traffic volume, road width, economic benefits of bicycle tourism to a rural community, percentage of road with limited sight distance and no passing lanes, and I don't know or I don't remember. The second question uses the figure that you can see um, below it. And so from using figure two, if traffic volume and speed data from a rural road fall within the white area of the Oregon Department of Transportation chart, suggesting a shared lane may be appropriate, then there is enough evidence for road owners in Oregon to determine that the road is safe for bikeway designation. True or false? And again, we'll give everyone just a few seconds to go ahead and fill those out. Um, and Rebecca, because we do have quite a few questions in here for you, I'm going to go ahead and read you out the first one. Um, I do also want to let everyone know that um, Rebecca did mention the USBRS information, um, and Sarah Snow from Adventure Cycling did put the link for that into the chat pod. So if you're interested in learning more about that designation process, the link is shown in the chat pod. So Rebecca, the first question for you is, can we please clarify road owner's definition? Are we talking property owners along proposed routes? Uh, what if the owner of the road is a county? Can they automatically make the decision to designate a route? OK, good question. And I, I didn't specify that. So road owners refers to the organizations that have jurisdictions that operate and or maintain any section of road that a bikeway is located on. So that's typically the Department of Transportation, counties, and, and federal ma land management agencies like the Forest Service. Perfect. Um, and before we go ahead and ask, ask you some more questions, I have gone ahead and closed out the polls and broadcast those results, so you should be able to um, discuss the answers. OK. Um, the first one, what quantitative data is relevant? It looks like uh, most everyone um, captured that, you know, the, the factors that are important and that economic benefits is important, but it's not, ne it's not necessarily related to safety. And yeah, I think the point was clear in the, um, for the Oregon chart that it's one part of a decision-making process, but there's much more information that, that needs to be considered. OK. Perfect. The next question that we have for you is, um, is the Oregon planning document the same as the document which is the subject of this webinar framework for bikeway designations? Yes, <laughs> and we are working on, we are working the, no. oh. No, so the Oregon document is not the same as this. This is a supplement, going to be a supplement to that. There, oh, there so goes. Oregon, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Oregon has a scenic bikeway document that is developed, and in the handout section, there's a handout called Bikeway Links, and I've provided links to the Oregon um, Parks and Recreation Department website that has all of those documents on it. 
Um, and this document is a supplement to that that's intended um, more as a tool for road owners um, to evaluate the safety of, of scenic bikeways, or of not just scenic bikeways, but any, any road that's proposed to be a bikeway. Perfect. Uh, the next question for you is, how is the right-of-way accomplished for the bikeway? Is it part of the HED? Um, bikeways are typically established on existing roadways. There, there isn't new construction to add shoulders or anything like that, and so it's really just the letter of support from the road owners that this existing roadway can be designated as a bikeway. Hopefully that answers I believe, the question. Yeah, I was going to say, I believe it might answer the second part of the question from the same um, responded as well, and that is who is typically responsible for the operations and maintenance of the bikeway, striping and signage, et cetera? The proponent group typically works on the signage and the marketing of the bikeway, um, but the road owners ultimately are responsible for, for maintaining and operating the road, and you know that's one of the biggest challenges to this program is that there isn't additional funding that, that comes to, to help with that. Um, and the next question for you is, is there a citation available for the Wisconsin rating system for cycling that you mentioned? Yes, there is, and that will be in the document. Um, and I can provide that after the webinar mm -hmm. to everybody. Sure, and if um, may, perhaps while Taylor is speaking as well, I'm not sure if you are able to do that because I think you're working off the same computer, but we can get that to everyone as well. Um, generally, following our webinars, we have a thank you email, so we'll make sure that that link is provided in that. Uh, the next question for you is not clear what the Wisconsin system is attempting to predict. Is it safety, crash rate, comfort? That's a good question. So the Wisconsin method is based on the, the risk of a, the chance that a, a triple pass might occur. So it's based on safety and I, I would say comfort as well, but what are the chances that a bicycle and two vehicles will um, come to the same point in the road at the same time? And so they've calculated based on different traffic volumes um, a, a risk of that. And so it's I guess it would, I would say it's based on safety, but also road um, comfort of cyclists as well, just from a volume perspective. Okay, um, and then we did have, just so everyone is aware, Alex was nice enough to put in the Oregon link right into the chat pod for everyone as well for the reference to that document. So thank you for doing that, Alex. Um, and at this point, we have finished the questions for this section, so we are going, I am going to turn this over to Taylor and let him talk about the remaining two learning objectives. Taylor? Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, talk with you all a little bit um, about uh, bikeway field safety visits. So what, is, what exactly is a bikeway field safety visit? Well, uh, it's something that is loosely modeled on the 2012 Federal Highway Administration Bicycle Road Safety Audit Guidelines. It, however, is not a road safety audit uh, because those have specific criteria and are conducted by trained personnel. In general, road safety audits um, also address a specific issue um, or evaluate design considerations for a specific project. A bike race uh, the bikeway safety field visits often cover a much longer section of roadway and are not targeted at a specific project. Instead, they aim to evaluate the safety of an existing roadway with the understanding that significant changes are not going to happen. So as part of this, uh, as part of this project, Sharing the Road to Federal Lands, um, we conducted three different bikeway safety field visits. Uh, the first two we did uh, to inform the development of the framework. Um, the two routes that were chosen for that uh, were chosen because they were uh, considered representative of concerns and challenges present on many bikeways. 
Um, and so those two were the Cascading River Scenic Bikeway. That's uh, 72 miles long. Uh, 38 miles of that is um, on USDA Forest Service land, including two different forests. 26 miles of it is on Oregon DOT Road. And the remaining mileage is on uh, two different counties and two different town roads. So you can see the, the challenges with num numerous jurisdictions um, all needing to, to sign off on the designation of this bikeway. The second one was the proposed Hell's Canyon Scenic Bikeway. Uh, we looked at 77 miles um, of that, uh, 48 miles of that was Forest Service, 18 miles was Oregon DOT, and the remaining was on uh, county or town roads. And this was one section of an originally proposed 262 mile bikeway. Um, it was proposed a couple of different times in different ways, but was never designated due to lack of road owner support. Um, our experiences with um, hosting or putting on these three different uh, bikeway safety field visits was that they are tremendously valuable. Um, and so we were able to really get a handle on, on the value of them um, and begin to include them in this document. The, the third one um, was the proposed Offer Heidi Scenic Bikeway. Um, and we used that one uh, to pilot the, the framework. So we had a draft of the document prepared, and we took that forward um, on the Opter Heidi. And that was chosen because there is a desire um, to designate. And the Forest Service is generally supportive but has some concerns. So that's you know, the situation that, that we've been talking about um, quite a bit here. So I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about why you might want to do one on a proposed uh, on your proposed bikeway. And I guess I'll take this moment to say that the intent of the framework, while it's um, certainly centered around the Oregon process, the intent is that it be applicable outside of Oregon and that it be usable by road owners across the country who are looking at bikeway designation. So why would you want to do this on, you, on a proposed bikeway? So it really is you really want to do it to bring together the road owners and the bikeway proponents to share their perspectives. It's the opportunity to bring these stakeholders together with different expertise and experience, person to person, on site, away from other work where they can share their perspectives. You're also looking to get as many people on bicycles on the proposed route, as that will help everyone to see the route from, the, from others' perspectives. That being said, they are a lot of work, and so you may only conduct uh, one of these if there are areas of concern that are unresolved or addressed through the evaluation process that Rebecca discussed. Another reason to, to hold a bikeway field safety visit um, is to identify, discuss, and understand specific safety concerns on the proposed route. Um, so you're going to out there in the field with all with these people with different experiences and expertise and perspectives, and you'll be able to discuss the potential solutions to these safety concerns. And being in the field can help with the qualitative evaluation that was that was brought up earlier. It presents the opportunity to discuss the nuances or the intangibles that are not part of the evaluation process that Rebecca described. Such things as are there ongoing timber sales? When are log trucks present? How uniform is the traffic volume? Is it, you know, we saw the example Rebecca had, you had about half the number of vehicles on there during the week as you did on the weekends. How many specific areas of concern are there on, on a, say, a 70 mile section of road? So these are all things that do not fit cleanly into a quantitative analysis. By bringing together the safety and bicycle tourism and recreation, we can see the safety in a new safety concerns in a new way. Often road owners have not necessarily been on the road on a bicycle, and the proponents will gain a new perspective in riding with people who perhaps have less experience. And finally, being out in the field on the, on the proposed bikeway with the uh, broad group really provides opportunities to build relationships and explore partnerships. And this is a key aspect of this. Um, again, we'll get people away from the distractions of the office where they can focus on conversations 
perspectives, and listening to understand. It puts a face to the issues. In-person, on-site discussion of the funding realities and road maintenance objectives or priorities can help to build understanding and frame potential partnerships. And these face-to-face -face conversations can really help uh, to more readily build these partnerships. So who is it that we want to have out here uh, on, this, on this with us? And so we have listed road owners. That would include engineers or planners and certainly the maintenance personnel. Um, on the two that we did for the development of the framework, uh, we also had representation from Oregon Association of Counties. From the proponent groups, uh, that's tourism and, business and businesses related to bicycle tourism, both regional and local, bicycle clubs, and certainly the applicants. An example that we had was the Eastern Oregon Visitors Association, so that was a broad uh, regional destination tourism group. Law enforcement, um, they may or may not be available. Um, some jurisdictions really lack the resources to have enough dedicated uh, law enforcement um, to be able to send somebody. Um, this might include sheriff or highway patrol. The thing about the importance of having law enforcement there is they're often the people with the most firsthand knowledge of crashes or other safety issues such as speeding. And finally, elected officials can also be difficult to schedule and to engage, but they often bring a good perspective and can be important when forming partnerships. So where are we going to uh, conduct these bikeway safety field visits? Like the evaluation that Rebecca discussed, you'll divide the proposed route into sections. You want uh, you want to have everybody drive the entire proposed route, but we're going to select short, manageable, and representative sections for people to bike. So we want to look at the different jurisdictions. Different jurisdictions have different resources, different design or maintenance standards, and certainly different maintenance practices. Um, there may be opportunity for the different jurisdictions uh, to explore mutually beneficial partnerships. We want to look at different contexts of the road. So what is it like along the road? This is important um, as it affects the user behavior, both people on bicycles and certainly the motor vehicle operators. Different road characteristics. Um, so this is horizontal and vertical alignment, uh, roadway width, presence of shoulders, uh, and presence of striping. And then, of course, these areas of specific concern, places where um, the road owner um, or the proponent group, um, they, have, they have specific concerns about a, a particular location, whether it's extremely narrow roadway, um, very limited sight distance, uh, the steep descents with poor visibility. Um, you want to certainly include those. So what are the components to this bikeway safety field visit. Uh, we can see them here, and I'm going to talk through each one of them separately. The startup meeting, so this is the opportunity um, for everybody to meet each other, maybe for the first time for some people um, on this. Uh, it can be held um, on the phone or via web conference. Um, that was the way that we did it, given that there were people from um, broad regions. It, it didn't uh, make sense for everybody to have to be in one place for this. Um, so you're going to go through what data you already have and, there, and what data you might um, need based on the evaluations that Rebecca mentioned and, and other important uh, information. You may have come up with additional data since you went through the, the evaluations that Rebecca discussed, the quantitative. Um, and then this is an important piece is the identification of the sections for review. Again, you want everybody to experience the entire proposed bikeway, which means that you're going to drive most of it. You're going to select the sections to bike carefully, making them manageable for most people. And so that includes the idea of keeping them short, downhill, not uphill, if possible, and if it's steep. And so you, again, we want to make these representative of the concerns and, and of the bikeway, but we also want to make sure that we can get as many people on them as possible. 
so the other important part about the uh, startup meeting would be logistics. Um, in some cases, these may cover multiple days, depending on the length of the, of the proposed bikeway and the number of sections that are needed to be covered. So logistics may include such things as where are people staying, who has bicycles, who needs bicycles, what kind of vehicles are we going to have, what do the daily schedules look like, and, and planning for food, making sure that everybody is fed. So once we get, um, then we've got this planned, everybody is, is on location. Uh, the first thing that we want to do the, at the beginning of this is we want to have a site meeting. And, and this is, everybody gathers at a, at a meeting place, um, preferably inside, um, because these can, this can take a little while. And you're again going to go through, perhaps for the first time, face-to-face -face introductions. You'll review the schedule and logistics. Overview of the concerns, and then an important aspect is to cover cover safety. You're going to be on active roadways, and so ensuring that everybody's talked through safety and and understands what's going to happen in case of emergency. Um, at this time, it's also nice to to have somebody identify a couple of people identified as focusing on uh, documenting uh, with photographs and also taking notes. We're going to ask that everybody be um, observant and document conditions, but it's nice to ensure that, that you have certain people that are, uh, have that as a specific task for them as well. So then we talk about the specific site reviews, and then this is where we're going to ride or drive the sections uh, and observe and document the conditions. And again, this is important for people who are driving as well as people who are on the bicycles because we, we need the perspective of the people in the motor vehicle as well as the people on the bicycle. At the end of that, um, this is another important piece with, with respect to selecting the sections. It's important to have a place where you can gather everybody at the end, load uh, bicycles back into the vehicles to move to the next section, and have a debrief of that section. You want to talk through the issues on that section right away after doing it um, so, that you, so that issues aren't lost. Then at the end, either at the end of the day or at the end of, a, of the couple of days, you want to have the summary meeting. And this is, in, this is where you're going to bring everybody together, um, again, to, to discuss and document the overall outcomes. Um, you're going to look for, to identify next steps and timelines um, and assign tasks. Um, this is the opportunity to pull together the takeaways from each section and the overall route. And it's the chance to talk through with this broad group of, with lots of ex different experience and different expertise to talk through those qualitative factors, those pieces that it's hard to put numbers to or hard to put a real definition to. This is the opportunity to talk through those and to, uh, to get some clarity on those. Okay, I want to talk about two specific opportunities um, that, that should be taken advantage of during the bikeway safety field visit. Um, the first of which um, is identify bikeway information to include in bikeway plan development. An important aspect of this qualitative evaluation is understanding who the typical rider that is likely to choose to ride on the proposed bikeway. Location and geography will have an impact on this. But it's also important to provide adequate information to potential riders so that they can have an appropriate understanding of the conditions they will encounter. The bikeway safety field visits should be utilized to identify what information needs to be conveyed to potential riders to establish that expectation. I'm going to talk a little bit more this, about this um, when I talk about Chapter 5, which is informing users. And additionally, the field visit is a good time to open the discussion of the proponent's roles in helping to maintain the bikeway. This on-site, face-to-face uh, -face setting of the field visit can foster frank and open discussion of opportunities for partnerships. There are many examples of friends groups partnering with federal land managers and others. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the funding in Chapter 6. Okay, so what are the potential outcomes from these bikeway safety, field safety visits? Um, one thing that I want to highlight in this list, again, I mentioned it, but is information for inclusion in the plan. And that's, that's a critical, critical outcome of this. Um, 
But the bikeway safety field visits provide an opportunity to address the qualitative aspects of the evaluation, a chance to explore those aspects of concern that seem to defy a clear definition. The conversations and sharing of perspectives and experiences of the varied group may bring clarity to the issues and help the road owner and proponents identify a path to designation that was not obvious from the quantitative evaluation. Okay, so making sense of this, we've now, Rebecca's talked a little bit about making sense of the, the quantitative evaluation and, and now what about the qualitative evaluation? And so designating a road as a bikeway does not mean that the road has ideal or per perfect conditions everywhere for everyone that bikes. Rebecca mentioned that earlier. People who choose to ride Oregon Scenic Bikeways and longer distance bike routes across America are likely accustomed to biking in less than perfect conditions. People that are uncomfortable biking in traffic, near vehicles and on roads that have poor pavement or other less than ideal conditions will choose not to ride if they are given the right information. So as Rebecca said, the roads that are rated good or moderate for biking but have other less than ideal qualities should not necessarily automatically be disqualified. Rather, the road owners must feel comfortable that the information people need to know about the road is readily available and that the proponent groups are willing and able to convey that information through the marketing materials. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about the remaining chapters uh, in the book, and these are going to be very brief overviews um, of chapters that have quite a bit of information in them. Um, but they were frequent topics during the development of the framework. Now, the first one is road owner liability, and this certainly was a top conversation all the time. This is a very big subject, um, and this chapter provides a general discussion of liability, provides some references, and cite some relevant case law that, with regards to bikeway designation. It's important for everybody to understand that liability is incredibly nuanced based on agency type, uh, state law, federal law. There are a lot of different aspects to, to the liability. It should, not, it should not be assumed that designation will impact runner, road owner's liability, nor should it be assumed that designation will not impact road owner's liability. This is too dependent on many factors to go into this assuming one way or the other. Road owners should always consult their legal counsel regarding liability and bikeway designation. It is important that the road owner document the process that he's used in making the decision regarding designation. The evaluation processes we've outlined here provide a framework for documenting the decision-making process. This documentation of the process and the considerations factor into an agency's liability. Okay, uh, chapter five is on informing users, uh, and this discusses the importance of informing road users and potential bikeway users of what to expect. So this means everybody, for the motor vehicle operators, this means letting them know to expect bicycles. And for the people on bikes, this means setting their expectation appropriately and providing them with information so they can make an informed decision. Providing answers to questions such as, what is the surface? If it is paved, what is the general condition? Are there shoulders? How much motor vehicle traffic is there and what kind? Are there times when they can expect fewer vehicles? This is all information that will help somebody to decide whether it's an appropriate place for them to ride or not. So on the screen, there are some screenshots that were taken from uh, the Scenic Bikeways webpage, and they give good general information um, about bikeways in general. You can see the note that um, many bikeways do not have cell service and are on roads with car and truck traffic. Um, in addition, there is specific information with respect to the different, the bikeways are broken down into um, different categories from mild through extreme, with a mild ride uh, being described as fun, casual rides appropriate for nearly everyone. The traffic is light and the terrain is mostly flat. And then we can see the challenging one here, which is the Cascading River, is one of the ones that, uh, that we looked at. In addition to the general discussion, 
Uh, in Oregon, for designated bikeways, there are maps and cue sheets to provide more detailed information about the specific bikeway. These are developed during the writing the bikeway plan stage and have traditionally included information on services or points of interest. These cue sheets and maps, however, are opportunities to provide roadway-specific safety information to potential riders. Many first-time riders searching for information on the route will reference these. Including the information identified during the site visit in these resources can help riders make an informed decision about whether a particular bikeway is appropriate for their experience and comfort. The, um, in the handout section uh, are uh, available the cue sheet and map from the Cascading Rivers um, so that you can see it in a little more detail. The images are very small. So things such as steep descents with difficult visibility, areas of possible rock fall or locations of logging operations are examples of this potential information. Providing too much information could be counterproductive as it may discourage people from reading it, but highlighting areas of specific concern will help set riders' expectations. And this is an area where partnerships with bikeway proponents and tourism organizations play a vital role. All right, and finally, uh, Chapter 6 discusses funding, also a big subject. Uh, and this chapter really serves to introduce um, the idea of looking to creative partnerships to help fund certain portions of the bikeway, um, particularly in maintenance. So proponents and road owners can work together in creative ways to address safety concerns such as uh, site distance due to brush, due to uh, encroaching vegetation, sweeping, sign maintenance and repair. And this will certainly take creativity and surely take time to work through the details of these arrangements. But as someone from the Visitors Association put it on one of our bikeway field safety visits, the public lands and the roads that access them are the assets on which many tourist businesses are based. If there's not investment in maintaining these assets, this is not good for business. Like hotels or restaurants, they need regular maintenance. So I have a few. Uh, the one example that I'd like to um, pull out is the uh, Friends of Highlight group that was formed here in Bozeman. Uh, Highlight Canyon is a forest service area um, that sees high use year-round. Uh, this group came together a number of years ago um, to help out, and they host cleanup days. Um, but of real note is the, their campaign to help uh, get the road plowed. It used to be that the road was not plowed in the winter. Um, cooperation between the county, Friends of Highlight, USDA Forest Service. Um, now uh, this road is plowed throughout the winter. Um, you can see on there that the plowing um, cost for the 17-18 winter was around $21,000. Um, county crews and equipment were used. Um, and that accounted for about 40% of the overall cost. Friends of Highlight contributed 35%. The grant that was written by Friends of Highlight was 16%, and the USDA Forest Service contributed 9% of that from their outfitter and guide fees. So this is just one example of, the, of, of a number of ways that Friends groups can come together and help road owners um, make these accessible and maintain these bikeways. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, as I mentioned before, it's important to recognize that this framework, while based on the Oregon uh, process, is really intended for use on a much broader scale than that, um, as well as being useful in Oregon. And we are stopping one last time for questions now. We do have a few for you guys as well. But again, if you do have any remaining questions for any of three of our speakers, please put those in the chat pod on the left-hand side now. I'm going to switch us over to our poll break for you. Our questions for you this time are, which of the following are not an intended outcome of a bikeway safety field visit? Check all that apply. Improved understanding of safety concerns amongst road owners and bikeway proponents. Shared perspectives on bikeway designation amongst road owners and bikeway proponents. Identify specific design criteria for a mitigation project. Develop new relationships or partnerships. Ensure the road owner will improve payment conditions or I don't know, I don't remember. And the second question is, in addition to quantitative information such as traffic speed, volume, road width, et cetera, what qualitative information is relevant when considering whether to designate a rural road with a shared lane as a bikeway. Check all that apply. 
the experience level of riders who are likely to choose to ride the bikeway, availability of information that will set riders' expectations, width of the narrow bridge on the proposed route, how changing conditions such as vegetation encroaching onto roadway may affect bicycle safety over time, all of the above, I don't know, I don't remember. And again, we'll just give you guys a few seconds to fill those out. Okay, and at this time, it looks like we have all of our responses, so I'm going to go ahead and close these and broadcast them for you, Taylor. You should now be able to see the results. Great, thank you. Okay, for the first one, which of the following are not intended outcome of a bikeway safety field visit? Um, the key here is, is the sort of not part, um, and, and I must have done a poor job of uh, explaining that the bikeway, I mentioned the road safety audits, and the road safety audit certainly is about identifying um, specific design criteria for a mitigation project. Um, but the bikeway safety field visit is for evaluating the safety of the existing roadway with no intent um, for a future project. Um, and, this, and the last one, too, ensure the road owner will improve the pavement conditions, also not an intended outcome um, of this. These are existing roads. Um, often with jurisdictions who, who, don't, who are not maintaining these roads specifically for bicycle use, um, and it is not the intent of this um, to ensure that anything is going to change in the future. It's to evaluate the condition of the road as is for the safety of bicycle use. Um, and the second one, in addition to the quantitative information, what qualitative information is relevant when considering whether to designate a rural road and this one, uh, admittedly, was a little unclear. The intent was that it was all of them, with the exception of the width of, the, of a narrow bridge on the proposed route. That's a little bit more of a quantitative um, number, given that it's a specific width, ties into the stuff that Rebecca did. But it certainly is a part of the qualitative uh, thing also. Perhaps more relevant would be how many narrow bridges are made, how many pinch points are there um, with respect to uh, the overall route would, would be one of those qualitative things. It's a little bit harder to, to put a specific num numeric analysis to. So yeah, Taylor, hopefully that clarified a little bit. I apologize for that not coming through in my presentation. We do have a few questions that came in for you on the chat pod as well, so I'm going to read those out to you now. Uh, one of them is, given that most, if not all, of the roads permit bicycles already, that no additional funding is provided to road owners and that no extra duties are imposed on road owners, what is the purpose of allowing a road owner to veto the inclusion of a road into a bikeway network? Does this process help gather support which translate into road improvements? Um, my impression of the older bike centennial model has roads chosen for a route which were included to route maps without allowing road owners to veto inclusion of good cycling roads. Did that model fall down in some ways? Well, wow, that's, a, that's a great question. And I see that um, Paris from Adventure Cycling um, put in a wonderful answer with respect to the U.S. bicycle route system. Um, and I think that um, this is certainly a big part of this conversation. I think the, the, liability, the liability chapter um, has some discussion uh, about the generalities of um, that no extra duties are imposed on the road owner. There is a, it is a question whether designation impose, imposes additional duty of care, um, and that is not entirely clear. Um, certainly, I think that um, there would be a hope that this designation um, would, would bring additional funding. The problem is that um, just because uh, the roads see increased use, 
most of the road owners are not going to see increased money for maintenance. They only see increased maintenance costs. And that's where I think the, the proponent groups and the tourism groups can really play a role in thinking about coming up with creative ways to bring those increased tourism dollars to bear on the asset that is this road. And how do we leverage those dollars um, and, and that support in order to, to make these improvements. So I don't want to say that this, you know, the intent of this isn't that there never be an improvement, but it's important that the evaluation not be contingent on there ever being an improvement. Hopefully that clarified a little bit. I think um, <coughs> this is Alex. Um, just real quickly on that question, the whole reason for the road owner having so much control over it is to create a partnership and buy-in so we can all work together on improvements and on promotion. Hello? Um, another question that we did receive for you guys as well, um, I believe it's from the same source, is wondering if there um, the number of instances of road owners, owners opposing bikeway designation on the roads. Do you guys have any sense of that? So I, I don't necessarily. I might, um, Amy might have a better sense with respect to the Forest Service one. I mean, certainly I talked about the Hell's Canyon one, um, and that was different jurisdictions at different times were not supportive of that uh, bikeway. Uh, part of it is that at one point, it was proposed as 262 miles um, that covered lots and lots of jurisdictions. So uh, I'm not exactly sure how that played out. Alex may be able to speak a little bit to that as well. I think Amy I, would have heard more of the behind the scenes stuff of any, any opposition. Yeah, this is Amy. I, I don't know if I can offer a, a figure on that. Um, maybe what I want to, maybe one way to sort of address that uh, is to say that um, from the Federal Land Management Agency perspective, speaking for the Forest Service, um, we, we joined in the effort to pursue a project like this because we didn't want to be, uh, we, we wanted to participate as partners in the program. So, so we recognized that some of the proposals that were um, being put forward that included Forest Service roads were not going through the process as smoothly as, as could have been possible. And so part of this project, part of what we wanted to achieve was that we would have a tool that would allow us to participate in a, in a more consistent way statewide. And, and so I guess I just want to make sure that folks understand that our perspective is not to be oppositional in our view and to deny designation. It's really about listening to all the perspectives at the table. And it may not be about um, strictly a yes or no to the designation, but it's also about managing the bikeway together to mitigate those risks that we collectively identified. And so I know I didn't answer your specific question, but I, I just wanted to make sure that I'm sharing that um, the, the re one of the big reasons we pursued a project like this was to really help strengthen that partnership. And I think Alex got to that a minute ago. And this is Taylor again, and I'd really like to follow up on that. As Amy alluded to, you know, we, we worked with a lot of Forest uh, Service and other fan, federal land management agency employees on this. And, the generality is that there is support for these. Um, there are just very spe sometimes very specific concerns that, as Amy said, need to be addressed. But, but the support that and the um, partnership aspect of it that came from Forest Service in particular was truly remarkable. So I think it, you know it's sort of the the probably the exception, not the rule, that road owners are going to uh, oppose this. And that's very much what we saw when I was there. I was on, um, working at Oregon State Parks for almost 10 years doing the program. And 
there's um, we had twice as many applications as the ones that were designated. Most of them were denied due to scenic values, um, or that we just decided the committee decided not to move forward on. But there's so there was 30 applications total, about 30, all of them with letters of support from road jurisdictions. So yeah, it's it's pretty supported. I don't know if that's because it was Oregon that is tourism aware and tourism positive and cycling aware, um, if it would be different in different states. I do want to thank everyone um, for all of the great questions and, and for the four of you who've been responding to them. I do appreciate that. At this point, we are going to go ahead and close out the webinar as we've reached 2.30. Um, our learning outcomes for today's webinar were to state the differing points of views on bikeway designation by bikeway proponents and road owners, to demonstrate an understanding of the background and need for the framework for bikeway designations on rural roads, to identify relevant data to consider when evaluating the safety of a shared road, to differentiate between the quantitative and qualitative considerations of bikeway designation, to identify key components of a bikeway field safety visit, and to summarize the benefits and outcomes of the bikeway field safety visit. Um, I do want to mention as well that we have a couple of upcoming webinars for the Safety Center. Our next one will be held on February 28th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, and that one will be a recap of the, the second Safety Summit that we just held in December in Savannah, Georgia, entitled Bridging the Gap. And so at that webinar, we will be um, providing those of you who are unable to attend um, a rundown of what happened and what kind of topics were discussed at that. We will also be having um, a webinar in March on Thursday, March 28th, and that one will be on the um, National Association of County Engineers um, Road to Zero grant that they received and uh, the outcomes of that. Their grant was to provide um, information on advancing local road safety practices with state DOTs, and so that will be discussed in March. We're also working on an April webinar that we hope will be on marketing safety. So stay tuned for all of that. We also wanted to bring your attention to another webinar that we thought might be of use for our audience. It is being held by the Center for Health and Safety Culture. It is called Traffic Safety Culture and Driving Under the Influence of Cannabis and Alcohol in Washington State. That one will be held Wednesday, February 20th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, the link right there is for how you go about registering for that. Again, all of these links are provided in the PDF version of, the, um, of today's presentation, which is available in your left-hand corner in the handouts, so please do download that. It will also be available um, as a handout on our website with the archived version of this webinar if you need to go back afterwards to find it as well. And I do just want to thank one more time our, our presenters, um, and I have left up on the screen their email address. I believe you can all see that at this point, but Dana, if you could fix the attendee list so that we can see the slides again. Um, so thank you again to Rebecca, Taylor, and Amy, um, and also to Alex who jumped in and answered some questions for us as well. Their email addresses are now on the screen if you guys do have any additional questions um, that were not answered today. So thank you all and have a great afternoon.